This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. This week, I uh, want to go back to one of the topics which I've uh, discussed before, uh, which is the situation in Ukraine. And uh, of course, things have evolved since I last talked about it, and uh, I have some rather different ideas to share with you to think about uh, as this uh, war uh, seems to be rather entrenched and uh, to be uh, gradually escalating. And to do this, I want to raise, first of all, uh, an idea which uh, is around in many of the social sciences and, and actually in the sciences in general which is the idea of path dependency. That is, a path is taken, a small escalation of something, uh, irritation uh, does something uh, to some group, some group responds because of its response. Uh, the first initiator, X, uh, decides to come back in and they escalate and before you know it, uh, way down the line, uh, they're uh, you know, killing each other in combat. Now, uh, there are some uh, fascinating explorations of path dependency, particularly in relationship to the First World War, where the sense is that uh, the path to that war uh, was worked out in separate stages and ultimata and so on. And the actual outbreak of the war uh, resulted from a mistake. And I think this is very Im important to recognize at the very outset that mistakes can happen. And the mistake in this case was an ultimatum was given to uh, Britain uh, on a Friday evening. And uh, the, homes, uh, the, the foreign secretary, uh, Lord Grey, I think it was, uh, was on the habit of late Friday afternoon. He went off to his estate out in East Anglia somewhere and didn't really take care of anything until Monday morning. And uh, the ultimatum that came to him on Friday, uh, obviously, uh, needed to be responded to immediately, but he made no response to it. It, it expired, and so the Second First World War uh, broke out, much to uh, Gray's surprise, when he came back into the office on Monday morning. Now, something as simple as that uh, is the sort of thing that we're, we're looking at, and I'll uh, use some examples uh, later on. But in the case of Ukraine, I've already mentioned that there's a certain basis for uh, what Putin is doing. And, you know, no matter what you think of Putin and so on, you have to, have to imagine how the world looks from Putin's standpoint. Because if you don't do that, you don't know what standpoint you should take in order to try to elicit the kind of end game which you want, which is to ward off uh, some kind of warlike confrontation between NATO and Russia. Uh, that warlike confrontation between NATO and Russia will likely lead uh, to some nuclear exchange. And if we get into nuclear exchanges, this is, this is real serious stuff. And almost all the other social and environmental issues we can worry about would be completely obliterated in, in a, a, a nuclear uh, uh, confrontation. So this is where I think we're at. And I think we are a little bit on that path and on the sort of path which could take us to that result unless we really watch out. And therefore, this is a moment where the public should be alerted to that this might happen. The public should be alerted to the ways in which this might be uh, uh, dealt with, in ways it, may, it might be somehow or other uh, got out of the way. And we have to understand that in these kinds of situations, uh, people bluff, you have to know when to bluff. It becomes a bit like a poker game, but like in any poker game, the art is to know when to fold, uh, when to get out of a particular pathway which seems to be leading to something uh, like mutually assured destruction, which is what uh, all pretty much all nuclear uh, planning and capacity is based upon. Now, the, 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 we started uh, last time, and I made a great deal of uh, effort to try to point out that the way in which NATO responded to the collapse of the Cold War 
was a serious problem and was recognised to be so at the time and has been recognised ever since. There was a, an article by uh, uh, Tom Friedman even uh, some time back which kind of said, look, uh, this was what happened back in the 1990s. It's not a good idea. I also liked very much the, the fact that at that time, uh, George Kennan, who was the big architect of uh, uh, a post-war sort of containment policy against communism, so therefore was no friend of communism, but could, he couldn't understand why it was uh, that the response to the uh, collapse of the Cold War was actually to expand NATO rather than to uh, render NATO irrelevant. And here is what he says. He said... In this talk, I think it is the beginning of a new Cold War. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely and it will affect their policies. I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. No one was threatening anybody else. This expansion would make the founding fathers of this country turn over in their graves. Of course, there is going to be a bad reaction from Russia. And then the NATO expanders will say, We always told you. That, that is how the Russians are. But that, that, he said, is just wrong. Now, the point about this is that this set the stage. And the stage was that Central Europe uh, had been under uh, Soviet control. The collapse of the Cold War meant that Central Europe became open to be, you know, join the, the, the international system on some terms whatsoever, and Central Europe was gradually absorbed into Western uh, European system. Uh, now, this meant that uh, NATO was extended to Poland and, 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 and to Hungary and, and so on, and, and gradually, bit by bit, NATO is expanding up to the Russian borders. And then the, the proposal came uh, three or four years ago that Ukraine, Georgia should be part of NATO. Now, look at this from Putin's standpoint. He was, he's moving from a situation where the Soviets are in control of the whole of Central Europe. Central Europe has now actually gradually gone over to being integrated with the West. Some of it's joining the European Union and some of it is going into NATO. And bit by bit, the West is kind of coming closer and closer and closer to, to Russia's borders. Now, this looks kind of pretty threatening. And in fact, this kind of threat had been, had been there before. And here I want to go back and again talk about something which occurred some many, many years ago. Because back in 1962, in October 1962, I found myself in a major political demonstration in the city of Bristol, down in the city center. There was a demonstration order, organized by CND, which is the uh, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, and the occasion for the, the protest march uh, was the Cuban Missile Crisis. So a very raucous group of people were marching through the center. There was an equally raucous response on the part of the public, many of whom... Uh, some of, uh, well, not many of whom, but some of whom seem to have been people who'd served in the Second World War and who took the view that we were all about appeasement and appeasement and that sort of got us into the Second World War and we should keep out of that and all that stuff. So it was a bit of an ugly kind of relationship between uh, the demonstrators and the crowd that was uh, in, in, around in the shopping center. The, but if you go back now and think about what happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, there is Kennedy suddenly informed that the Russians are actually moving, the Soviets are actually moving to set up a missile capacity in Cuba so that they could attack the United States. Uh, it turned out afterwards that the, the, the United States uh, services were, were, were very badly informed and the CIA was not well informed. They didn't at that time know that already uh, there were missiles in Cuba and that already there was a very substantial uh, military presence of, uh, of Soviet soldiers and, and military in, in Cuba. In fact, uh, the, 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 the intelligence was so bad that that, that, that uh, now, Kennedy hardly knew, uh, you know, what, what exactly the situation was, but he had to guess. And the idea was that the, the Soviets were going to set up a, 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 a hostile 
nuclear capacity in the island of Cuba. And this was a no-no as far as uh, everybody in the United States was concerned. And you know, later the, uh, revelations suggest that um, many of uh, Kennedy's staff wanted uh, there to be an immediate nuclear confrontation to take out Russia immediately. Kennedy, to his credit, decided not to do that. But the issue then was Kennedy trying to find out how to negotiate a way out of that particular situation. And that particular situation, it turned out, had a parallel. And uh, Kennedy finally found out that there were actually U.S. missiles that had been located in Turkey. Now, look at the map of the world. There is, there is Soviets, and suddenly, to their southern border in Turkey, there's a missiles which are being, hand, you know, being set up by the United States in a very hostile manner. And I think at some point, rather, Kennedy realized that what, what, what Khrushchev was doing in Cuba was, in effect, the same thing as the United States had been doing in, in Turkey. And so at that point, that, that, when, once Kennedy understood that, this made it possible to negotiate the way out of the crisis by basically saying to Khrushchev, OK, you turn around and take your missiles out of Cuba and keep out of Cuba, and we will take our missiles out of Turkey. And sure enough, in April of uh, uh, 1963, uh, the, the American missiles disappeared from Turkey without saying very much. I mean, none of this was made public at the time because it would have seemed, seemed that, you know, uh, Kennedy was stepping down, he was appeasement and all of that kind of thing. But that was the way in which the, 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 the Cuban Missile Crisis was, was resolved. But the important point of it was to understand what it was that Khrushchev was doing in Cuba in relationship to why it was that Khrushchev was doing it and what it was that was bothering Khrushchev so much that he wanted to do this and push this confrontation up to the U.S. borders. In other words, there was the United States sticking missiles on Russia's borders, so why shouldn't Russia put missiles on U.S. borders? Just, you know, tit for tat kind of thing. And having realized that, it then became possible to negotiate the way out of the uh, of the crisis. And this is, in effect, what happened. But in the middle of this, and here I think you should really go to a book by a man called Sherwin, which is called Gaming with Armageddon. And what, what Sherwin does is to, is to give a detail of exactly how all of this took place. And there was one issue that arose, which, which is fascinating to, 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 to think about. And the issue was this. Actually, the Soviets had nuclear, nuclear submarines, uh, that is, submarines uh, with nuclear warheads, uh, that, that were, and several of them were, in fact, in Cuban waters. Uh, the CIA really didn't know this. They kind of guessed that might be there, but they were not, were not, uh, couldn't track it down at that time. One of these submarines uh, was disabled. And because it was disabled, it had to surface. But it was so disabled that it lost all communications and its oxygen system was wrong and everything was wrong about it. So the, the, the sub surfaced without knowing that an agreement had been reached about what to do with the missiles. So there they were, in Kimonikado, uh, disabled. And... You know, the U.S. then flew over the, the submarine, and, 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 for, and apparently for fun, one of the pilots in the, uh, the, the, of the American airplanes decided to drop, drop a few hand grenades on the, on, on the sub, just to, just to, uh, the phrase was, just, just to scare the, the, the Russians. And, the, and this is what they did. And the Russian commander of the, of the submarine apparently took this as an extremely hostile act and ordered that the nuclear-tipped torpedoes be loaded in, in, in uh, the bays, the, the torpedo bays, ready for action. And he was ready to fire them. But the command structure within the submarine was very important. And it was this, that any decision to fire the nuclear things could not be was not in the hands of the of the captain, but was in the, in the hands of the chief Communist Party officer you know, within the crew. And the chief commanding officer, seeing what was going on, said, don't fire it, don't fire it. 
Now, the thing was, uh, according to Sherman's account, uh, probably there were only a, a few minutes between the firing of, the, of, 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 this, of this nuclear missile, uh, nuclear torpedo, the firing of this nu nuclear torpedo, and the countermanding of, of that by the, 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 the Communist Party official. Uh, if the Communist Party official had been asleep or was had a different position, the nuclear thing would have gone off. And U.S. response to this is, this is where it's terribly important. U.S. response to something like this, a nuclear doctrine at the time, rested on the theory of mutually, uh, uh, mutually based destruction. Uh, and what, what the policy was from the Eisenhower years onwards, what the policy was was that any exchange would l result in a total obliteration of the, the, the Soviet Union, and also at that time, China. That is, the US at that time was prepared to destroy the major cities in uh, the, the Soviet Union and a hundred major cities in China all at once in a nuclear exchange. And that this may have been the response to that submarine firing a nuclear missile it was not a missile, but a nuclear torpedo. Um, now, there's a fascinating book that just came out two or three years ago uh, by Daniel Ellsberg. And, and, I, and I think the Sherwin book and the Daniel Ellsberg books are crucial. And if you want to know about the Ellsberg book, you should go to the website and, and get a, a discussion between him and Noam Chomsky. It's fascinating because it goes over a lot of what nuclear doctrine was all about from, nine, from the Eisenhower years onwards up until the missile crisis and up, and this is the scary thing, up until this day. In other words, something like this could go on with North Korea, something like this could go on uh, with Russia uh, and, and Iraq, and, and, and something could go on with this in Ukraine. This is, this, is, this is pretty scary stuff. And in that discussion, Ellsberg at some point or other says, well, you know, I, wanted, I, was in, make, I was part of the planning organization within the Pentagon about this, and I asked the question, how many people would die in a nuclear exchange of this sort, if if the, the, that had gone wrong in Cuba and, and and mutually assured destruction had taken place, what what would the result have been? How many people would have died? And he got back an answer, step by step by step by step, and it was about a billion people. And it's and that is an unthinkable possibility. But it was a real possibility because that was the nuclear stance of the United States at that time, and I repeat, up until this day. If there is any sign of a use of a nuclear mech weapon, the United States is prepared to destroy all of the cities in the Soviet Union, in, in Russia, and all of those cities in China. That's 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 what the doctrine is about, and that's uh, whether that would happen or not. Of course, it, it depends very much on the president of the time and what the president of the time might do. But but this is this is the the thing, and it could easily be triggered by a mistake, a mistake, for instance, about, about a disabled uh, disabled submarine, <clears throat> which had to surface and had to be gotten out of there by. Uh, by the by, the Russians without uh, without a, a disaster occurring, and and so this is something that it really concerns me right now, because okay, a billion people, but it's not only a billion people because a few years later people suddenly started to recognize that a nuclear exchange of the sort they were they were actually contemplating, a nuclear exchange of that sort would create something called a nuclear winter. Now, there's a story about the nuclear winter, which, which is kind of interesting, and I'll just, just, just a sideline of it, because I, I like these kinds of stories. It turns out that Lord Byron, of all people, went to live in Geneva in 1816. And he was joined in Geneva in 1816 by the Shelleys, Percy Byers Shelley and Mary Shelley. That summer in Geneva, it rained. All the time, Hard, people hardly ever saw the sun. Nobody knew what was going on. And it was in that summer that Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. 
because, you know, they were sitting around a log fire in the middle of the winter and kind of saying, God damn, it's cold and it's rainy and what the hell's going on? This is so gloomy. Why is it, why is it going on? Why was it raining right throughout the summer in Geneva in 1816? And the answer was a volcano in Indonesia, I think it was called Tombaro or something, had exploded and it had thrown so much soot, garbage into the atmosphere that radiation from the sun could not enter in. This is the reverse of global warming. Global warming, of course, you trap the heat inside by the gases. In this case, it's particles in the atmosphere. And, and particles in the atmosphere from the explosion of this volcano in, 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 uh, caused a, a huge problem in the winter. Now, if you nuke 100 cities in China and all the major cities in, the, in, in, in Russia, you're going to have a hell of a lot of debris in the atmosphere. And the calculation was it would take about 10 years for it to, to disappear. During those 10 years, agriculture on planet Earth would have been almost impossible anywhere. Anywhere. So nuclear winter, which would take about 10 years to dissipate, almost, almost certainly would mean mass starvation. So you're not only talking about a billion people who are killed directly from the from the from, from nuclear exchange, you're, you're, you're talking about most of the world's population would starve to death over 10 years because you wouldn't be able to cultivate any crops. And this problem of getting the, the, the wheat uh, out of Ukraine uh, and Russia uh, into world markets is a minor, minor problem compared to the fact that no, no wheat could be grown pretty much anywhere with this nuclear winter situation. And, and in, 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 in the calculations on that are very, are very real. So here you have the, the United States sitting with a doctrine of mutually assured destruction, prepared to nuke anybody, and the United States abrogated to itself the right for first strike and basically trying to understand what is going on around the world. Now, there are nine countries with nuclear capacity. Any one of them could launch into it. The, the most dangerous one is, of course, Israel and, and, and Iran. Israel has threatened to take out Iran if Iran gets a nuclear weapon. Uh, but here's the interesting thing. Who makes this decision? And a fascinating thing comes up in the, in the, in the, in the Chomsky-Ellsberg uh, conversation when they discuss who has the nuclear button. I mean, Ellsberg pointed out, he said, look, the, the, it's not that the president has his finger on the nuclear button, because in the event of a strike against Washington, the president would be dead. So you don't want to have a situation in which the only person who can press the, 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 the nuclear button is the president, who is likely to be the first target. So you delegate it. So somewhere out in Omaha, there's somebody in a bunker somewhere or other who also has a finger on the button. But... Uh, they may be under surveillance by the Soviets uh, or, or by Russia, so you want them to, to, to delegate authority to somebody else. And, of course, you may end up with some guy driving an old, a beat-up old car around with, a, with, 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 with the black box uh, in, in the event that all of those entities are taken out and so, therefore, the, the missiles have to be... You know. So it, it's 100 people who've got their fingers on the button. And any one of them could be caught up in some sort of accidental uh, act and, 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 and something which, which would lead into some sort of nuclear exchange. Now, let's look at the, what is actually happening there in the situation in Ukraine. What we've seen is Ukraine is invaded. The Ukrainians uh, uh, resist uh, to somebody, uh, we think probably to Russia's surprise, and resist very fiercely. They get armaments, and they start off with javelins and other stuff to go uh, anti-tank weapons and so on. They now want tanks, and they now want artillery. They want aircraft and so on. They want long-range missiles and so on. So there you see the path dependency. And every time the president of the Ukraine comes on and says, we want this, we want that, we want these kinds of missiles, we want those kinds of missiles. So you want, you see the escalation going on and you see Russia escalating in return. They're, they're beginning to use missiles from submarines in the Black Sea and so on. And so there's, there's, a, there's an escalation going on all of, all of the time. And Putin has not 
ruled out the possibility of using a tactical nuclear weapon. Uh, the U.S. says it is not contemplating such a thing. But on this point, the whole history, Ellsberg, Tomsky, and so on, go over, and I would share this with them on, on this, is when the U.S. says it is not doing anything, don't believe them, because they've always been doing something. And right now, I bet you they are pre preparing all kinds of possibilities for a nuclear exchange. And I'm sure they're really up to speed on it. And they also have the possibility of developing as much intelligence as they possibly can about where the nuclear capability lies in, in, in Russia, how to get at it. How accurate that is, we don't know. But we've seen some real, real bad so screw ups by uh, by the U.S. intelligence and, and CIA and so on, getting things very wrong. So we have to be very careful about about running with that. And I certainly don't believe the United States is being passive about this. And it's probably sending signals, very strong signals, to Russia, saying this is what we are prepared to do if you use a tactical u nuclear weapon. Um. Well, tactical and nuclear weapons, again, this leads to non, when is a tactical nuclear weapon just a tactical weapon as opposed to a nuclear weapon? My view is it's a nuclear weapon, full stop. And as soon as you start exchanging nuclear weapons, there are you know, different kinds of nuclear weapons, to be sure. You're going to use the ones which are most effective, and you're going to use the ones which presumably would take out the launching sites of the of, of, of Russian capacity of nuclear weapons. These these are the sorts of things which, 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 which are really beginning to bother me about the way in which this, new, uh, this crisis is going. It's heading towards something like a nuclear confrontation, unless we're very careful. The United States keeps on repeating it does not want NATO to be involved. But listen to what the United States says. What the United States says and what Lloyd Austin, the general, who is the Secretary of Defense said, was that the United States' aim was to render uh, Russia, a Russian military capability, uh, so, so, so bad, would be so badly destroyed, so badly organized, it would not be a, 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 a political or military kind of confrontational problem for, for, for decades to come. In, in, other, in other words, Look at the situation. Ukraine is fighting for its life, and they're fighting for its life. And yes, they want all of the, all, all, all of the weapons they, they possibly can get. And what is the U.S. doing? The U.S. is giving it to them. But notice something. It gave $40 billion to Ukraine. Well, it says it gave $40 billion to Ukraine. In fact, it gave $10 billion to Ukraine, and it gave $30 billion to weapons manufacturers in the United States to provide the weapons to Ukraine. In other words, don't think it's for, oh, like $40 billion goes to Ukraine. Most of it stays in this country and it's just sent to all the weapons makers and the manufacturers and so on. And they're as anxious as hell to get, you know, get, get that stuff used. First off, they often don't know how it works in practice in war, so that's, it's a great idea to test it out. And, 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 and secondly, it's great that it's, it's being used up because then they can manufacture more and they get money for it. So, so, so this is the, the, the here we have a, a situation where where the, the military industrial complex is well on board. Austin is saying, "Oh well, our, our our plan," and actually, it's using Ukraine. This is the terrifying thing. It is using Ukraine, not because it loves Ukraine, but because using Ukraine is the opportunity to so degrade. The uh, Russian military capacity that it becomes a nothing. Now look at the similarity here between what happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Khrushchev was mad as hell because the United States was putting missiles right, right up against its border. Putin is mad as hell because NATO is coming right up to his border, and 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 NATO is not in in Putin's experience. A defensive organization is an offensive organization, and it takes offense, as it did, for example, in the Balkan Wars. And you see what NATO did in the bombing of Serbia, and you'll see that NATO is an interventionist. It is, it is, is about trying to restructure the world in certain ways. Furthermore, NATO now controls all of Central Europe. And here we come to a crazy geopolitical argument. You know, there's a crazy, well, he wasn't crazy, unfortunately. He was a professor of geography 
at Oxford University, and there's a man called Halford McKinder. And Halford McKinder, back in the early 2000s, right up to about 1942, was writing things about geopolitical strategy on a global level. And his thesis was, whoever controls Central Europe controls the world island, i.e. the whole Eurasian sphere. And whoever controls the world island controls the world. In other words, control of the world depends upon who is controlling the heartland of this system, and the heartland is in Central Europe. Now, the Soviets controlled the heartland throughout the whole period. Now, it is the West that controls the heartland, and the U.S. backed NATO, which is controlling the heartland. And the heartland is threatening the whole control of the Eurasian mass. That is the way in which people think. That's the way in which, you know, Lloyd Austin and the military folk think. This stuff, this sort of stuff. Now, I, I actually held uh, a professorship in Oxford, which was called the Halford McKinder Professorship of Geography. And it, I, I, I mean, on the one hand, I thought that Halford McKinder would be turning in his grave, think that I held the professorship in his name. But I was also extremely embarrassed to be, have a, a title of the Halford McKinder Professor of Geography. Because there's this guy who's giving this kind of geopolitical nonsense. And this is terribly important because if people believe it and work on it, then that creates the problem. Actually, in the 1920s, the German geopoliticians, a man called Haushofer, really did believe in this. And much of the expansion of Germany into Eastern Europe and into the Central European area was precisely on Mackinder-type policies. And in the 1920s, General Haushofer was writing about Lebensraum, that is the living space of the German state. And, the Ger and it needed Lebensraum, and it needed to actually control all of Central Europe. And from that control of Central Europe, it could actually organize, organize the world and its strategy of, of world domination. And Hitler seems to have believed some of this. So, so part, part of this was, was what was going on at that time. My point about all of this is this. We are on the edge of a conflict between NATO and Russia. In fact, a proxy war is being fought in Ukraine. And the United States believes and likes to present itself as somehow or other, it is a good country which is simply responding to the desire of the Ukrainians to control their own space and have their own nation and have their own culture and all the rest of it. And that noble, worthy aim is what the United States is about. I demur. I think the United States is using the Ukraine and is using the Ukraine for the nefarious reason of trying to degrade uh, Russian military capacity to be able to actually, if you like, forward the kind of mission of Western domination of much of, of the rest of the world. Of course, now the situation is such that fooling with, you're not only fooling with, 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 with Russia and all of its, its missiles, but you're also fooling with China with its major military capacity. And you can see why China, and in China, they think geopolitically too, along the lines I've mentioned, China is actually moving geopolitically through its Belt and Road Initiative and all the rest of it to try to regain some sort of control of uh, what Mackinder called the world island. This is where we are headed at. And the path dependency of this is making me very, very, very nervous. And an interesting question is posed right at the end of the discussion between uh, Chomsky and, and, uh, uh, and, and with, the, with the Chomsky discussion. And, and, and it was, well, what, what, what can we do? And here I'm bothered by the fact that somehow or other, everybody's put this conflict in Ukraine on one side as if there is no danger. Yeah. There is danger, and and it's clear danger. And some compromise has to be meet, has to be come to, some sort of, you know, point when which you fold rather than continue. At what point do you kind of say, well, this has gone too far; it's too dangerous. At what point are, are we going to actually recognize that Putin has uh, actually a genuine, you know, you may not like it, but he has a genuine reason to fear 
of what NATO has been doing and what NATO has been about. And that therefore, one of the answers, which I think should, should be on the calendar, is the complete demilitarization and denuclearization of the whole of Central Europe. That, it seems to me, is about the only thing that could actually bring Putin to the table, offer something like that, say, we will actually uh, accept the denuclearization, the demilitarization of the whole of Central Europe, and we will turn it into a neutral zone so nobody can you know, dominate the world island and do all those kinds of things. This is the kind of thinking which needs to be there. And this is the kind of thinking that got, got us through the missile crisis in Cuba. The missile crisis in Cuba was a very close thing, a very close thing, and a lot of people were making some very bad decisions around it. I think we are closer to that kind of thing in Ukraine, and a lot of people are making some very bad decisions about it, including the Secretary of Defense, who should have known better than to say that, although I'm glad he did say it because it gives us an insight into what the true motivation of the United States is in sending $40 billion uh, to uh, Ukraine, uh, $30 billion of which comes straight back into the pockets uh, of the military-industrial complex. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.